Hello, my name is Charlie Lees, and this is an update on the results of the Clarity IBD study for patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. These are my disclosures. We now have effective vaccines targeting the spike protein on the outside of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19. There are six different vaccines now that have shown to be safe and effective. All prevent severe COVID and death. In the UK, we have the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, JCVI. At the end of last year, they recommended delivery of the first dose to as many eligible individuals be prioritised, and that was ahead of second doses. They recommended the second dose be delayed by no more than 12 weeks after the first dose, and that policy was then adopted. Two sets of key guidance about COVID-19 and IBD. The first for the International Organization for IBD, patients with IBD should be vaccinated against COVID, do it at the earliest opportunity to do so, and do not defer because a patient is on immune suppressants. Similarly, do not stop or defer immune suppressant therapy for a patient to get vaccinated. The BSG guidance strongly supports COVID-19 vaccination for patients with IBD, with the risks anticipated to be very low. The key concern with patients on immunosuppressive drugs is around the theoretical risk of suboptimal vaccine responses. Tarek Ahmed and his team in Exeter with Nick Kennedy, James Goodhand and Claire Bouchy as project manager, along with Nick Powell, then set up the Clarity IBD study to look at this over time. Claire set up 92 hospitals. We recruited 7,226 patients in the 10 weeks leading up to Christmas. We recruited two patients on infliximab for every one on vedolizumab. Both sets of patients need to come up to hospitals for regular infusions. Patients on vedolizumab are not expected to have a, a, a reduced immune response to vaccination and therefore we're going to be a good control group. We looked first to see how many people had evidence of prior COVID-19 disease by looking at antibody levels. You can see the highest levels in London, the Midlands, the northeast of England, the lowest levels in Scotland, Wales, and the southwest. So the first question, have patients on infliximab and vedlizumab had similar COVID-19 experiences? Yes, they have. Adherence to social distancing measures was the same. Exposure to COVID-19 cases was the same. There was no difference in reported symptoms of suspected COVID-19 or those who tested positive by PCR for SARS-CoV-2 or those who were hospitalized with confirmed COVID-19. So in fact, this was good news for patients treated with infliximab. So the next question, given that, was do the same number of infliximab and vedlizumab patients have COVID antibodies? And the answer is they don't. We saw antibodies in 3.4% of infliximab patients versus 6% of vedlizumab patients. Furthermore, there was an impact of immunomodulators, that is azathioprine, mercaptopurine, or methotrexate. So infliximab plus an immune modulator was 3%, whereas vedolizumab without an immune modulator was up at 6.3% developing antibodies. So the next question, what factors are associated with having antibodies to COVID? And the answer here is non-white ethnicity, as we had seen before, geography, as I showed you already, and um, no social distancing. So patients in our survey that said they didn't social distance were more likely to have antibodies against COVID. And then what about factors that are associated with not having antibodies to COVID? The strongest factor was infliximab, and the second strongest factor was immune modulatory therapy. Okay, so moving on. What does this mean then in terms of how likely you are to have antibodies to COVID if you have had a proven infection? So in those people who were PCR positive on vedolizumab, 83% of patients went on to have antibodies to COVID, whereas it was only 48% with those on infliximab. Moreover, if you look at those patients on infliximab by itself, it was 60%, so a bit higher, but the lowest level were those 
patients on infliximab and an immune modulator together. So to summarize, patients on infliximab are no more likely to get COVID and after COVID infection have reduced antibodies. What does this mean? Well, it doesn't mean too much at this stage. It means please keep taking your medicines and it means we should try to answer how this translates to COVID-19 vaccination. So this is part two. And this is um, a preprint that we went uh, online today. So this paper has not yet been peer reviewed, um, but we are very confident in these findings. The key question here is what is the impact of infliximab on the immune response to COVID-19 vaccination? We had to wait till we had access to the anti-spike protein antibody because this allows us to measure vaccination as opposed to natural infection. At this point, we had 865 of the Clarity patients on infliximab with one dose of a vaccine and 428 patients on vedolizumab. And um, really very nicely, this split roughly to 50%, 50% across uh, both drugs and both vaccines in terms of the grouping. So it allowed us to make clear comparisons. So the key question then is, how do spike antibody concentrations compare in patients on infliximab and vedolizumab? And you can see in this graph this blue line above which um, there is increasing levels of protection and below which there are decreasing levels of protection. You can see here on the left-hand sets of panels, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, and on the right-hand set of panels, the Oxford vaccine. In the green, you can see patients on infliximab had lower levels below this blue line after one dose of vaccine, whereas those with vedolizumab had levels above this blue line. And we saw that with both Oxford and the um, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines. So next, what factors are associated with spike antibody concentration? Well, to the left of this dotted line here are factors associated with lower levels, and this is infliximab, this is an immune modulator, this is Crohn's as opposed to UC, this is older age, and this is smoking. On the other hand, if you are of non-white ethnicity, you are more likely to have protection after the COVID vaccination. We then look at what percentage of patients develop protective antibodies against COVID. And we do this for both of the vaccines and the left-hand set of panels for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. The right-hand set of panels is for the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine. They show the same. So I'll just show you this on the left of the Pfizer-BioNTech. You can see the lowest level of percentage-wise patients developing protective antibodies for patients on infliximab and an immodulator. Um, going up with infliximab by itself, going up again with vedolizumab and an immune modulator, and the highest levels in patients who are just taking uh, vedolizumab. Now to turn this round into a good news story, what we found was that if you have had two exposures to antigen, that is either prior infection with COVID and one dose of vaccine, or two doses of vaccine, you return to protective levels. So you can see here on the left, patients on infliximab with no prior infection, as we saw before, are below this blue line. But if they've had prior infection, they're above. And if they have two doses of vaccine, they are also above. We see vedolizumab showing a similar increase in these groups, but all above um, the blue line. And this is the same with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine too. So this really is comforting and reassuring that whilst levels are low after one dose, if you've had COVID before and get one dose of vaccine, it looks like you're fully protected. If you have two doses of vaccine, again, it looks like you're fully protected. So to summarize these findings, patients on infliximab after one dose of either vaccine have lower levels of protective antibodies to COVID. But patients on infliximab have normal levels of protective antibodies if they have already had COVID and get one dose of vaccine or have two doses of vaccine. So a couple of follow-up questions. What medicines are affected? Well, we suspect this applies to all anti-TNF drugs. So for IBD, this is infliximab and adalimumab mostly. And whilst we did not study it on its own, we suspect that the effect that we see in combination with infliximab and immune modulators also applies to people who are taking immune modulators on their own. So that would be azathioprine, mercaptopurine, and methotrexate, although it's probably a lower effect. 
And then is this just relevant to IBD? Well, we've only studied it in IBD, but we suspect this also applies to patients taking uh, these medicines um, with other diseases. So for example, joint or skin disease. So finally, if you're one of the patients taking one of these medicines, what should you do? Well, please don't be worried and please keep taking your medicines. Your chance of flaring and coming to harm if you stop on these medicines is much greater. Please get vaccinated against COVID at the earliest possible opportunity with whichever vaccine you are offered. They are both fine. After the first vaccine dose, please continue to socially distance. We should all be doing this anyway. And we will try to get priority for second vaccine doses, um, but this will be largely out of our control. In the UK, um, the vaccination program and rollout is going very well. Everyone um, on infliximab and azathioprine should have been offered their first dose of a vaccine being in groups four or group six. And this uh, chart on the right hand side shows in the dark blue those patients who've had their second dose. This is going to happen very rapidly. So hopefully everyone will be fully protected soon. So in the meantime, I would point you to the Crohn's and Colitis UK website, which is being regularly updated with additional information. And I'd finally like to remind you all to be kind to each other and to stay safe in the meantime. Thanks for your attention.